Good afternoon and welcome to the week four lecture video. Uh, let's go ahead and start by praying. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for giving us uh, this day. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to, to come together uh, and to have this moment where we talk about the subject of research methods and have this opportunity to pray together. Lord, we just ask that what we learn today, uh, the, this material, the reason why you brought us to this class um, is tied to the will that you have for us, Lord, because we acknowledge that you have a will for us and we want to do that will. And we know that everything happens for a reason. You put us here for a reason. And therefore, we just ask that you connect what we learn today to um, the plan that you have for us. Lord, we dedicate uh, this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at the agenda. Okay, so as always, I provide a worship video for the week. So go ahead and take a look at that worship video. Again, it's my favorite artist, uh, Michael W. Smith, Let It Rain. Okay, it's a really good video. Uh, next thing, I just want to reiterate that this course is uh, designed to be a three-pronged approach to learning about research methodology. Okay, the first prong is theory. You get the theory by reading the textbook and taking the quizzes, and of course, us reviewing the quizzes here in class. Prong two is SPSS. <clears throat> uh, SPSS uh, lecture notes are the key there. And again, the whole point is you're not going to learn all, uh, you know, the the exact, uh, here, let me rephrase it this way, you're not required to have SPSS. Uh, so the point is not to learn all the buttons to click in order to get the answers. The point is to understand how to interpret the statistics. So again, that's all that's going in your notes there. And it's going to be utilized when, actually, when you're reading the 10 articles that you're finding for the literature review portion of your introduction section, as well as when you finally get the results for your paper. Uh, you know, that is going to be your opportunity to uh, take what you learn from the SPSS and try to interpret this, the statistical results that you get uh, for your paper. The third prong is the actual research paper. And this is rolling out through lectures, through the discussion forums and other assignments. Uh, particularly when we talk about other assignments, I'm talking about the rough draft assignment. So for example, you've turned in the article summary uh, assignment or rough draft, if we wanna call it that. Uh, and then uh, this week you're turning in the introduction rough draft. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at quiz three. Give me a second, let me share my screen. Okay. What is the goal of operationalizing the definition? The answer is to enable another researcher to replicate the study. Okay. Uh, but what does that mean? Okay. If you're talking about self-esteem and I'm talking about self-esteem, if, if I say I'm operational, operationalizing self-esteem using the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, then what you can do is you can say, okay, that makes sense to me. When I talk about self-esteem, I'm going to talk about self-esteem as measured by the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. So then we're talking about the same thing, which would be people's scores on the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. And again, when we're doing that, if I use the Rosenberg self-esteem scale, okay, in my study, now you can use the same Rosenberg self-esteem scale in your study, and therefore, you can literally replicate the study that I did, if you choose to. What is the difference between a directional hypothesis and a non-directional hypothesis? 
uh, directional hypotheses predict the type of difference to be found. Non-directional do not. Okay. So <clears throat> again, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. I feel like non-directional hypotheses are are kind of more like research questions. Well, a research question would be this. There's a relationship between gender and self-esteem. Actually, let me rephrase that. A research question would say, is there a relationship between gender and self-esteem? A directional hypothesis would say, females tend to have higher self-esteem than males, okay? A non-directional hypothesis would say, there is a relationship between self-esteem and gender. Does that make sense? So the research question is saying, is there a relationship between self-esteem and gender? The non-directional hypothesis is saying, there is a relationship between self-esteem and gender. The directional hypothesis is literally stating uh, high self-esteem, or sorry, uh, females tend to have higher self-esteem than males. Okay. Which of the following is an unbiased research sample? Okay. 20 first year students are randomly selected and agree to interviews about college transition. Okay. And, and, and why is this unbiased? It's unbiased because these 20 first year students were randomly selected and all of them agreed to participate, okay? If 20 first year students were randomly selected and only 15 of them decided to participate, it would now be biased because the, the five that decided not to participate, well, why did they decide not to participate? Are they different than the 15 that participated in some way? Okay, and if they're different than the 15 who participated, it's going to skew the data. Okay, a questionnaire emailed to all 18 clients of a social worker has 16 returned completed. Again, this, this, is, this is biased because it's one social worker, okay, and not everyone completed it. So these, these clients weren't randomly selected. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and even if they were randomly selected, two didn't respond. Okay. A survey on self-care posted on a website for cancer patients gets 1,860 responses. Well, again, you know, when we're, when we're dealing with, uh, with this, okay, <clears throat> It's these people aren't randomly selected. Does that make sense? Every student in a class completes a survey about their family's socioeconomic status. Okay. Well, why would this be biased? Well, because these students weren't randomly selected to participate. They were just selected because they happened to be in the class. So that's when we're when we're thinking of a, a, a random sample, those are really two things to, to consider. Okay. One, are people randomly selected to participate? And if they are randomly selected to participate, does everyone respond? Okay. First of all, the first thing really never happens. People are really never randomly selected. Okay. Remember, we were talking about convenience samples before. And the second thing, if we do use random uh, uh, selection, does everyone respond? And the answer is no. So it's really, um, <clears throat> really difficult to have a unbiased research sample. And again, this is the need for meta-analysis, right? So we have all these convenient samples, meaning I can I conduct personality and gay marriage attitudes at uh, UC Riverside, okay, and I recruit undergraduate introductory psychology students who need to participate in research to fulfill their course requirement, right? That's a convenient sample. Were they randomly selected? No. So there you go. Okay. So now let's say 
this sort of study, personality and gay marriage attitudes, is done, you know, across the country and many different nations. Well, eventually, we can say that our findings are from an unbiased sample, if you will, when we do something called a meta-analysis, when we literally take all of these convenience samples and we aggregate them or add them together. And so they become one. So at that point, uh, we, we move from the uh, biases of convenience sampling closer to uh, the bigger picture, if you will, something that's more unbiased. How might a random number table be used by researchers to select study participants? By assigning the population numbers, then picking participants whose numbers are in the table. Yeah, well, that's fine. We Or we could, again, uh, we, we visited this last time. I believe it was last time, but uh, random.org. Okay, and there it goes. So again, how, how can we do this? Let's say, oops. Let's say that I, I wanted to uh, take a random, let's see, how might a random numbered uh, table be used by researchers to select study participants? Okay, well, uh, so basically a random, uh, a table of random numbers and they're in the back of some stats books. They're kind of archaic. Uh, but basically it's doing this. This is electronic, a lot easier. Let's say, let's say the university has uh, 10,000 students and I wanna randomly select about uh, 50 students to participate in my study. Okay, so I can number all the students uh, from one to 10,000 or use their student ID numbers and randomly generate them, but it looks something like this. So. Uh, student 2,801 will participate, uh, 4,142 will participate, uh, 9,040, 9, uh, 3,120, and so on. So again, <clears throat> uh, random.org, random number generation is, is good when you're trying to use random assignment, assign people to a treatment or control group, or if you're trying to randomly um, pick, if you will, or randomly sample people to participate in a study. What does stratification mean in random sampling? Uh, devising homogeneous groups to ensure better representation. So stratification is just is, is homogeneous. What does it mean? Some, something that's very uh, similar, right? Heterogeneous would be different. Okay, so you, you wanna take maybe a, a, a subgroup of males, right? That'd be a homogeneous uh, subgroup, a subgroup of uh, females. And then you can randomly sample from each. So let's say you wanted a equal split between males and females in your study, and you wanted to include 100 participants in your study. Stratification would look something like this. You would create a homogeneous subgroup of males. So you'd group all the males together, all the females together. Then you randomly select 50 males, randomly select 50 females, and that would be 100 participants to participate in your study. What can researchers do? So cluster sampling is unbiased. Increase sample size and stratify the clusters. And we won't get into that one. Why do qualitative researchers collect demographic data to show how the sample relates to the population? So you'll see that because we're actually going to cover that today. Okay, For our study, your study, personality and gay marriage attitudes, we're going to write the participant section of the method section. Okay, In this participant section, this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to discuss the demographics of those participants who participated in our study, okay? So we can understand how they relate to the population. So whether our population's the state or the nation or the world. What is the term used to describe participants starting the study but then leaving it? In research, this is called mortality, okay? 
Which of the following is an effect of increasing sample size? It, enhance, it enhances precision, which makes sense, right? So if you're studying studying the relationship between gender and self-esteem as we already as we were already talking about, I think we could agree that if I if I take five males and five females, right? So so I I, I have five males and I measure them on self-esteem. I have five females and I measure them on self-esteem, and then I see how gender and self-esteem uh, is related. Well. Wouldn't it be better if instead of five males and five females, I had 5,000 males, 5,000 females, and then looked at the relationship, okay? So when you increase sample size, you increase the precision. Because if you think about it, as you increase sample size, the closer you are to getting to the population, right? So let's say the population of females in the world is 4 billion, the population of males is 4 billion. If you collect five males and five females, that's further away from the population than if you collect data from 5,000 males and 5,000 females. When can researchers obtain accurate results from a small sample? When the population being studied has little variability. What's variability? Very, very, varying. Okay, so if there's very little variability in the population, meaning they, they look very similar, then it's not going to be an issue if the sample size is smaller. It's where if there's a lot of variability in the population, then you're going to have a harder time seeing things. And what could variability be? It could be people have different levels of self-esteem. People have different levels of openness. People have different levels of neuroticism uh, and so on and so forth. What is the generally recommended sample size for qualitative studies? Uh, 20 to 50. And again, qualitative studies are super helpful. I really enjoy them because you can really dig into the, the data, meaning qualitative is words, right? You can, you can conduct a survey, okay? Going back to our example of gender and self-esteem, where you, you ask 5,000 participants uh, these, these two things. What's your gender? Okay, so they fill that out. And then you have them fill out the Rosenberg self-esteem scale. Okay, well, that's great. Uh, uh, you can do a quantitative analysis. You can do a correlation and see how gender and self-esteem are related. Well, qualitative analysis would be cool because you can add that component where they can talk about their self-esteem, writing paragraphs, and then you can analyze the paragraphs. It's just a lot more detail, right? Okay, so that's, uh, that's quiz uh, three. Go ahead and email me if you have any questions. Let's go ahead and take a look at the agenda again. Give me one second. Okay, uh, SPSS lecture three notes. Again, let's uh, give me one second. I'm gonna go ahead and, and pull that up. Hmm. So once again, when you're taking notes on all this, it's what's in red that you want to document. All the interpretations, well, except for that. So you don't need the hint, but small correlation. You know, uh, let's see. Interpretation, interpretation, interpretation. Okay, all that stuff in red. Pretty much everything in red, that's your fair game. Okay, let's take a look at the agenda. 
one more time. Oh, good. Okay. So you all submitted your article uh, summaries, which is great. So that was your first rough draft submission. So I will provide assignment comments uh, by Wednesday, 11.59 p.m. So I think that will still be the case. Uh, unfortunately, I do have COVID. So, so far I'm feeling uh, okay. I'm doing this lecture video. And uh, so I'm assuming that date will be, will be good to go, but I'll let you know if it's not. But yeah, that's my goal to have those assignment comments done by Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. And once I finish, I will send you an email just to make sure you know that it's done. The next round of feedback after the article summary feedback will be based on your introduction rough draft, which is going to be due this week. So that being said, let's, let's get into the lecture uh, for this week, for the first part. Uh, so introduction and hypotheses. Okay, and, and I have a note here, start your introduction rough draft assignment as soon as possible. Okay, so, so something beautiful in this class is all these discussions we're doing, all the rough drafts we're doing, it's leading you up to your final paper, right? So that last week of class, you're not like, you know, fumbling around, struggling and trying to throw everything together, right? You're going to be essentially done. You're just gonna be polishing it and getting it <clears throat> uh, ready. So here, let's take a look at the instructions, right? <laughs> and this is this is for the introduction, uh, rough draft, but it's it's complete. It, it's great. So what we talked about last week was part one of the introduction. So part one of the introduction, right? You're going to have your title. You're going to have a relevant quote. Okay, you're going to define your main variable of interest and you're going to discuss the importance of your construct, which is your main variable of interest. And then at the end of that, you're going to state the objective of your study. Okay. So again, what is your main variable of interest? And I think you all probably get this, but I'll cover it one more time. It's all based on your hypotheses, right? So all of you have your hypotheses right now. That was the first round of feedback I gave you. I gave you revisions. Those revisions that I gave you those are your hypotheses. If you want to change them, go ahead and email me. So let's say one of your hypotheses, well, we'll just go with research questions just to keep it simple. Uh, <clears throat> never mind. We'll go with non-directional hypotheses. <laughs> Going back to the quiz, right? So <clears throat> gender is related to support for same-sex marriage. Race is related to support for same-sex marriage. Religious affiliation is related to support for same-sex marriage. Well, what's your main variable of interest? Support for same-sex marriage. So that's what this first paragraph uh, would be about. You would be, you would be introducing the reader to this topic, to this research area related to support for same-sex marriage. Okay. And 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 how do you do this? Well, really one trick is going back to the articles that you're finding. So for the second part of your introduction, your literature review, you're finding articles, right? <clears throat> well, this is related to your article summary that are, <clears throat> for example, gender and support for same-sex marriage, right? So you're finding those articles, you're reading those articles. Well, in their introduction, they're going to be talking about support for same-sex marriage. Well, that's going to give you an idea of how you can write it. Does that make sense? But again, the, the idea, think of a upside down triangle. The idea is the main topic of your paper is support for same-sex marriage. So you're defining what that is. How is it studied psychologically, right? So you, you start broadly and then you come down to the end where you're putting in the purpose of your paper. Okay, and the purpose of your paper is related to your hypotheses, but you're going to state it more generally. So if your hypotheses or if your non-directional hypotheses are there's a relationship between gender and support for same-sex marriage, 
There's a relationship between race and support for same-sex marriage. There's a relationship between religious affiliation and support for same-sex marriage. Your purpose statement would look something like this. It would look like, <clears throat> the purpose of this study is to examine the relationship between gender, race, re and religious affiliation. Sorry, <laughs> let, let, me, let me rephrase that. I, I'm gonna rephrase in a way that I think is better. The purpose of this study is to examine the relationship between gender and support for same-sex marriage, race and support for same-sex marriage, religious affiliation and support for same-sex marriage, okay? I was gonna try to group them all into one so there wouldn't be that redundancy of saying same-sex marriage over and over again, but I believe it's fine to do that. I think it just makes it really clear what you're doing. Okay, so that's part one. So that was covered last week. So part two is a literature review. And technically you've been working on part two since week two. All that part two is you're finding 10 articles that relate to your hypotheses, okay? So in this case, it would be gender and support for same-sex marriage, race and support for same-sex marriage, religious affiliation and support for same-sex marriage. You're finding those articles and you're doing article summaries. That's all part two is, the literature view. It's literally just 10 article summaries. And again, the article summary is objective, methods, conclusion. So part two of the introduction is 10. And it's good to break them up with subheadings. So you have three, all of you have three hypotheses. So you should have a subheading in your literature review that says the relationship between gender and support for same-sex marriage. And that's just an example. And then include all those relevant article summaries there. The relationship between race and support for same-sex marriage. And then have all those article summaries there and so on and so forth. Well, I'll do the last one. And the relationship between religious affiliation and support for same-sex marriage. And then put all your article summaries there. So that's part two. That's called the literature review. Part three is this. You're, you're going to want to summarize the main findings of your literature review. Okay. So literally just take the 10 conclusions that you got from your 10 articles and just summarize them for the readers. <clears throat> and then you're going to want to make this statement. Based on these findings, it is hypothesized that. So literally, you're going to summarize the findings that you, from your 10 articles in your literature review. You're going to summarize those findings. And then you're literally going to say these words. Based on these findings, it is hypothesized that. Okay. And then you're going to state your three hypotheses, exactly how I revise them. Okay. And again, if you want to change your hypotheses, send me an email. Cool. So let me know if you have questions about that. Let's go ahead and look at the introduction rough draft assignment. Let me share my screen. Okay, right here. Instructions, create an introduction section rough draft. Be sure to include the following elements. It's literally <clears throat> everything we just talked about. There you go. <coughs> Let's go back to the agenda. Okay, so the next thing we have to talk about is the method section of the research paper, right? The method section has three parts, the, the participants, the procedure, and the measures. So we're gonna keep it simple. This week, we're just talking about the first part, which is the participants section. 
like I stated when we were going over the quiz, the whole point of this is to communicate to people who are reading your paper what your sample looked like. And again, I want you to role play this out in your brain. You, 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 you are the researcher, okay? Who came up with your hypotheses and then created personality and gay marriage attitudes to assess your hypotheses. So personality and gay marriage attitudes is your study. So remember that, your study, your study, your study. So you're talking about your study here in the method section. So the introduction is talking about other people's studies. That's why you're doing the literature review, okay? The method section is telling people how you're going to assess your hypotheses, right? Because based on the literature that was covered, okay, that based on the literature you reviewed, you came up with the hypotheses that you came up with. Okay, the, the methods is telling the reader essentially how you designed personality and gay marriage attitudes and the participants who participate in gay marriage attitudes. So that's what the methods is about. The methods is describing your study that you created in order to assess your hypotheses. So this is an example, okay? This isn't the actual data. The actual data is below, but this is an example. I just <clears throat> made this stuff up. <clears throat> 416 students, 149 males and 267 females, mean age 19.4 years, standard deviation 1.31 from an introductory psychology course at the Southern California University participated in the study for course credit, okay? So what is this first part telling us here? I have a few notes here. So, and this is gonna be cook cookie cutter. I want you to write it the exact same way. You need to state the total number of participants who were involved. You need to give a gender breakdown. You need to give an age breakdown. Okay, so average age, you need to give a standard deviation. You need to say where the study was collected from. And you could just say a Southern California University, just like it says here. Was there any compensation or how were participants uh, compensated? Well, in this case, I'll let you know, they were compensated in this way <clears throat> for course credit. So you could just keep that. You need to document the ethnic breakdown. The sample consists of an ethnically diverse population with 5.3% African-American, 39.2% Asian-American, 13.2% Caucasian, 23.1% Hispanic Latino, 8.9% mixed. Now, why is this important, right? Okay. You talking about uh, sampling from the population I'm gonna tell you, this was not a random sample. This is a bias sample. And you can really see that because is this sample really representative of the average person who lives in San Bernardino County or LA County or the state of California or even the nation? Probably not, because look, the average age is 19.4. So the sample is very young, right? They're all, they're all from college. Does everyone go to college? No. Uh, ethnic breakdown. 39.2% Asian American. Yep, that's really high. 23.1% Hispanic Latino. So I believe in San Bernardino County, where I live, I, I believe Asian American is between 5 and 10%. Hispanic Latino is about 60%. So... Just in, as an example, uh, would this be representative of those who live in San Bernardino County? Well, not necessarily because the age is so low because the population is off. But again, the whole point is you do a bunch of these studies where you use convenient sampling 
uh, introductory psychology students. You do it all over the country. Uh, and then you could aggregate them or do a meta-analysis and then it kind of uh, makes the results clear, if you will, or less bias. Well, anyway, so here's, here's your data. So get this is the data from personality and gay marriage attitudes. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> so you're literally going to copy and paste this data into this template okay so this is fine if you i literally want you to copy this copy and paste and then change the numbers with this data that i'm about to show you so where it says 416 you're going to write 554 males and females. There are 241 males, right? 309 females. Four, when it, missing. So four did not indicate whether they were male or female. Average age. This is what you're going to write. I, where is it? <laughs> Maybe it's back. Is it down here? Average age, 19.1. Standard deviation is 1.49. And you're, you're going to say from an introductory psychology course at a Southern California university, and you're going to say they participated in the study for course credit. Uh, and you're going to say the sample consists of an ethnically diverse population, but you're going to fill in these percentages here. Right here, African-American 6.3%, Asian-American 37.9%, Caucasian 11.9%, Hispanic Latino 30.3%, mixed 6.9%, other 5.6%, missing 1.1%. Okay. So I think that makes sense. Let me know if you have any questions. Let's take a look at the week four, part two discussion assignment. Let me share the screen. Okay. There it is. Oh, it jumped. There it is right here. This is just the week four module. So just like we talked about, uh, write the participant section of your paper. Be sure to watch the week four lecture video before you begin, which is this video. Be sure to include the following, the overall number of participants, we covered that the gender breakdown, the racial breakdown, the age breakdown, Re respond to two other students, compare what they wrote, okay, to what you wrote, because <laughs> uh, what you actually write should be identical. So let them know if they made a mistake, basically, <laughs> okay? So literally what you all are writing is going to be identical, okay? Good. Let's go back to the agenda. Okay, assignments due Sunday by 11.59 p.m., the introduction rough draft, SPSS lecture four notes, week four part two discussion, okay, and then quiz four topics 34 through 44, okay, and again, what to expect for me, of course, I'm going to catch up on grading for what was due yesterday, I guess, which was Sunday. By Wednesday, it is my plan to give you feedback regarding your article summaries. Okay, and that's what uh, you should expect from me this week. Definitely email me if you have any questions or need assistance. I will be having office hours Thursday from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Yes, that's when I have it. <laughs> Okay, and that's all I have. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you uh, for today. Lord, thank you for, for
for giving me the strength uh, to to give this uh, lecture video, to, to create this lecture video. To, thank you for giving me the strength to uh, talk to these students about research methods and, and, and move along this class. Lord, thank you for giving me the strength to be able to show up here and, and pray and teach in your name. Lord, we love you and we give you all of our anxieties. We give you everything because we know that you have a plan for us. You have a will for us, Lord, and we submit to that will. Whatever it is, we put our complete faith in you. The ultimate trust exercise. Lord, and we just ask, as Jesus taught us to ask, for protection from Satan and his plans, because he also has plans. Lord, for those who are, are sick, heal them up so they can do your will. That is key. That is the theme. Lord, give the students the strength to carry on. They are in you. It is, it is no longer them, but you who lives within them. And they can do all things through you because you strengthen them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Number 6, 24 through 26. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding become, because it comes from our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the everything. For all these intentions and the ones we hold in our hearts, we pray to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Like I said, email me if you have any questions. I'll have office hours Thursday from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Uh, sorry, 6.30 p.m. All right. Take care.